Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it is my great privilege to be chairing the debates for the rest of the term. We have a controversial, topical debate before the House this evening. But before we get to that, uh, I want to take the opportunity to repeat something I've been saying a lot recently. Uh, and it concerns what we're doing this evening. Debates are what make us special here at the Union. As a society, they encapsulate perfectly what we're all about. Polite disagreement, engagement, dialogue, free speech. These debates are not for me, they're for you. My job is just to make sure the conventions and the rules are being observed. And my chief job this term is to make sure that all of you feel comfortable standing up, interjecting, challenging the speakers. If any of you have questions about how that works, please come and find me. Probably not now, uh, but after the debate, in the bar, before next week, whatever. Your right as members is to get involved with these debates. Um, so, the rules and conventions. The motion before the House this evening is that this House no longer has confidence in Her Majesty's police force. If you've got an order paper on the back, there's some guidance for how you can interject. I'm not going to do it exhaustively here, but at any time you can stand up and you can say, on that point, will you give way, point of information. And it's up to the speakers whether they take them, but I've encouraged them all to do so. These are not meant to be sort of six unrelated speeches. This is meant to be engaging and dialogical. I'm not going to say any more now, but uh, I encourage you all to participate through the debate. Um, what's going to happen is we're going to have two speeches, one in proposition, one in opposition, and I'm going to open to the floor for some floor speeches, and then we'll have another two speeches from the paper speakers, and then another round, and then the final two speakers, and we will vote with our feet at the end. But without any further ado, I will introduce you to our first speaker this evening, Jamie Klingler. Jamie is a writer, an activist, and a keynote speaker, book reviewer and pundit, on women's safety. In December, she was named ninth in the UK Communicators of 2021 by PR Week for her work with Reclaim Me Streets. Jamie, you have the ears of the house. A year ago, if I had been asked if I had confidence in the police, I would have said yes. I commend the men and women that put their lives on the line daily in service to our society. And I'm aware of the budget cuts that Her Majesty's Police Service have suffered over the years. But in my day to day, I barely thought about the police. Why would I? It speaks to my privilege as a white, middle class expat that, other than getting my phone nicked, didn't really have anything to do with the police. I was lucky in that the police were just background of my life. And then in March of last year, Sarah Everard went missing, stuck in my own living room. I closely followed the news of her disappearance. I was furious to learn that police were telling women that the only way to keep themselves alive and safe was to stay inside their own homes. We were already in a lockdown. On Tuesday, March 9th, it was announced that a serving police officer, Wayne Cousins, had been arrested. And the next day, tragically, Sarah's remains were found. For seven days, I had kept that little bit of hope alive. I was devastated and isolated. I live alone. The impotent bit of grief had nowhere to go. I needed to stand with other women. I needed to hug my best friend. I hadn't hugged anyone. I needed those other women to comfort me and I needed to offer space for those women to comfort each other. To remember Sarah and all women that have suffered violence at the hands of men. I tweeted that I was gonna put on a vigil for Sarah. 15 minutes later, I was introduced to some local Clapham women that were doing the same thing. We joined forces and Reclaim These Streets was born that night. I could easily spend the next 10 minutes on that, wouldn't need note cards. Um, but the relevant point is that we proactively approached the police to support and protect grieving women that wanted to come together in Sarah's name. Local Lambeth police were totally initially supportive, but then Scotland Yard got involved. They informed us that the gathering was illegal under COVID restrictions and the vigil would not be permitted to go ahead. As organizers, we were threatened with 10,000 pounds each in fines and prosecution under the Serious Crimes Act. Mind you, apparently if it had been BYOB, we would have been just fine. <laughs> we expected officers to be handing out tissues and showing their support and solidarity. Individual officers I've spoken to were as devastated as I was. Instead, the Met forced the issue. They made us take them to high court. 
The judge said it should have never gotten that far. The police had to set the parameters and we had to follow those parameters. While we tried to negotiate in good faith, in the very meeting that we were offering solutions like a moving memorial line or sessions from 12 to four and four to eight, while we were in that meeting with Scotland Yard, they sent out a press release that it would be illegal and it could not go ahead. We were forced against the Human Rights Act for our right to assemble to cancel. The next night I had to be on camera while I watched as police trampled flowers left by grieving women. I watched as police in front of the world's media manhandled Patsy Stevenson. That police were violent towards women at a vigil about violence by a police officer towards a woman blew my mind and I was not alone. The Mail on Sunday's headline was, the Met has lost the plot. When you've lost the Daily Met, the Daily Mail as the Met, you're in trouble. Inquiries were demanded. We were given 20 minutes with Dame Cressida Dick, who is the police commissioner of the Metropolitan Police Force on Monday. She was late and launched into a soliloquy, which we began with as a woman. I'm the only woman speaking tonight, so. Um, at some point I interrupted her and I asked, if you had to do it all over again, knowing what you knew now, seeing the videos that we saw from the vigil, what would you do differently? And her answer was chilling, and I quote, nothing. Without accepting a problem, there could be no solution. There is not an explicit effort being made to fix the problems within our police service, only to get them off the front pages. This so-called watershed moment was an opportunity to enact real change. They could have made an inquiry far-reaching. They could have made it statutory. Instead, a wasted opportunity and more of the same to follow. The lack of public confidence is making the streets more dangerous for the majority of police who are good people. They are absolutely crucial to the welfare of society. I want to have confidence in the police, but everything I've learned in this last year has made it impossible. Cressida Dick wants you to believe that Cousins is just a wrong'un. By pretending he's one bad apple, she's missing the opportunity to fix the rot. There's no hunger for reform. There's no acceptance that there's a major problem here. We deserve, de sorry. We deserve a force that we respect and honor and trust. The men and women on the force deserve that, but the systemic failure to not only recognize but admit failures means there's no chance for Her Majesty's police force being fit for service. Wayne Cousins used the same corona restrictions to abduct Sarah that were used to silence our vigil. Wayne Cousins was nicknamed the rapist by other officers. They knew who he was and did nothing to protect us from him. Wayne Cousins was in an armed and elite unit with David Carrick, who last week was charged with 29 offenses, including raping eight women. Serving officers spoke supportively of Wayne Cousins' character at his sentencing. After he had confessed, they are still on the police force. Bad apples? For six months, the Met knew that Wayne Cousins had used his warrant card and handcuffed and arrested Sarah. They did nothing with that information. They didn't proactively enact reforms that would make us safer. Instead, once that detail was re released, they advised women, if you think you're stopped by a fake officer, flag down a bus. And when that was ridiculed, they created safe connection where you FaceTime the station to make sure the arresting officer is actually a real officer. These are not real solutions to gender-based violence. We aren't scared of fake officers. I'm scared of real ones. As a solution to Sarah's murder by a serving officer, there's talk of recruiting hundreds of new officers and having plainclothes officers in bars. The real risk is 100 more Wayne cousins unless the vetting, training, and culture of the Met is radically reformed. When recruiting, we will get people drawn to power, not public service. In the past five years, there's been over 750 cases of sexual misconduct by officers with only 83 sacked. Most of those cases involved unauthorized access of police data. The police data is a predator's playground. Hundreds of officers were caught illegally accessing the information. Last week, a constable gained unauthorized access to police data regarding known sex workers who he was then known to meet. 
Women reporting they've just been burgled, attacked, or raped. Even worse, women that have been arrested and then being hands at the, at the hands of an officer, armed and misusing that information. How does that sit with you? Only one in 10 officers found guilty of gross misconduct lose their badges. If we were found guilty of gross misconduct in our jobs, we wouldn't have jobs. Most of those officers are also found guilty behind closed doors. Their names are never shared. We never even know about the hearings. An officer in Hampshire, specifically trained in domestic violence, abused his position to harass a vulnerable victim. He was removed from the force, but granted lifelong anonymity by the committee for his welfare. What about my welfare? What about your welfare? This means that that same officer who's been shamed and lost his badge can be hired by private security and be at a bouncer at vinyl where you get roofied. Is that who you want looking after you after you get spiked? The National Police Chiefs Council hired Maggie Blythe as the national lead on violence against women and girls. Only later did journalists tell me that she has no budget, no direct reports, and no actual power to force her recommendations get adopted. Recently, through freedom of information requests, the Times reported officers have covered up more than 100 cases of misconduct of other officers in the last 18 months. Over a third of the forces didn't even bother to respond, so that number is likely to be a lot higher. Last week, yet another officer was fired for photographing and sharing pictures of yet another dead woman on WhatsApp. This is apparently becoming a done thing on the force. Of the incidents where they got caught and we know of, there's at least four where officers messaged other officers pictures of brutally killed young women from the place where they lost their lives. What are we doing that these women are so dehumanized that they're texting dead birds with pictures of a woman that was stabbed a hundred times? Take Lowry Davis, a young Black Lives Matter activist from Swindon. I met her in London a couple weeks ago. Covert officers tried to get her to turn informant against other activists. They threatened her and her family. Had she not recorded the conversations, no one would have ever believed her. She was scared her therapist was gonna have her sectioned for being paranoid until she showed the tapes. That's what we're dealing with here. It sounds like something out of line of duty, but it's reality. Sue Fish was Nottinghamshire's highest ranking officer and she experienced the misogyny and abuse from policing firsthand. Last year, she said if she was raped, she wouldn't bother reporting it because of the current state of police. If the former top officer has lost that much faith and trust, who am I to contradict her? Let's go back to that word confidence, to have trust in, complete faith in, something to rely in, to believe in, or swear by. Have I lost confidence in Her Majesty's service? I certainly have, and I really wish I hadn't. Jamie, thank you for that marvellous speech. Uh, we move straight to the, uh, the opposition uh, and Sir John Hayes. Sir John uh, has been the Conservative Member of Parliament for South Holland and the Deepings since 1997. He is a member of the Privy Council and has served in six ministerial posts, including Minister for Security. Sir John, you have the floor. Every day, crime blights lives and it blights the lives particularly of those who are least well off, of those who can't buy their way out of disorder, those just about managing, those hard pressed suffer as robbers trash their lives, as burglars trash their homes, whose thieves make communities a misery. Thugs, vandals through disorder and threats spoil people's peace and violent thugs, as we've heard, destroy lives. In a world that's failed and faulted and fallen, for that is the bad news, ladies and gentlemen, the world is imperfect. We are fallen from the state of grace, just in case any of you thought we were not. In that kind of world, unless we stand by law and the police are the instruments of law and order, the guardians of peace, we will be dragged into chaos. They are the few who stand between us and disorder. The role they play is the foundation of social solidarity, essential to the health, wealth, prosperity, 
but most of all, the happiness of all of us. And as I've said, the most vulnerable are at the greatest risk. The privileged, by and large, can buy their way out of disorder. They can move to safer areas. They can live gated lives. They can create the kind of conveniences we protect them from those who live on the front line of crime. It's not those who live those gated lives in leafy enclaves and see things from the postmodern prism of privilege and power who have to fear declining law and order. It's those who struggle from all walks of life and most exposed to predations of the criminal mind. It's they whose lives were made nasty, brutish, and even, yes, short, as the long arm of the law withdraws from the communities and the base nature of bad people take over. This simple truth needs to permeate every mind in this chamber, that the police are vital to all of us. Without them, as I said, we risk chaos. Now, of course, of course, if we're all frail and faulted and fallen, so are the police. So are policemen and women. They're as imperfect as any individual in this room. We can't pretend that policemen aren't subject to the same weaknesses that permeate all of society. You've heard that in a very affecting and very powerful speech, I may say so, from the first speaker. But that's true of doctors. It's true of nurses. It's true of clergymen. It's true of farmers and bank managers and every other group of society. They're fallen too. And some of them will go the wrong way and do the wrong thing. Point of information. I will happily... Uh, oh, I'll happily accept your point of information. What do I do, sit down or stand? Oh, oh, right, well, far away. So, according to your argument, are you saying that rape, murder, are something sort of common in the rest of society? And so that should be um, sort of... Uh, how should we say this? Uh, accepted with a higher force, such as the police. So, you know, as you just said, is that farmers, uh, clergymen, um, police, they should be given the same... Uh, well, no, uh, forgive me. I, not can at I answer? All. Shall I answer? Um, okay, well, no, no, I'm just saying, because that, that seems to be what your argument is essentially ascertaining, is that moral failings, such as rape, murder, sort of... <laughs> undermining the law, that's something acceptable within all society, ergo, uh, I mean, should we accept that with all society? Because it's, it sounds like, for the most part, everything is sort of prosecuted as something not acceptable within society. And so what you're saying is that these moral failings, as you call, is acceptable within moral society. I'm just, I'm just I need, curious. Sorry, I need you to wrap up the point. Sorry. So, no, no, that's, that's essentially what I'm saying, and I, I feel like everyone... Well, I'm surprised that it comes as a shock to you. Uh, because uh, the truth is that all of human experience in every society since the beginning of civilization has had bad people who do bad things. Of course, it's our values and our traditions and our expectations and our decency and our morals and our courage and our traditions that stand between us and that chaos. But of course, people, there will always be people that will be inclined to do the wrong thing, and it is law and the instruments of law, namely the police, that stand between us and that chaos. I'm just going to make a little more progress, if I may. I'm going to, I'm going to make a bit more progress, if I may. So the simple truth is that every time we defund the police, as Black Lives Matter want to do, of course, uh, as you know, every, every time we undermine the police, we weaken that protection against the forces of crime and wickedness, which otherwise would prevail. Now, I'm not, def I'm not, I'm not going to defend every policeman, uh, every police force, every police leadership. Of course I'm not going to. Because when the police are found wanting, they must be punished. They must be called out. They must be prosecuted. They must be pursued. Of course that's true, and that's right, and it's as it should be. But we can't take the whole of the police force, every policeman, woman in the country, every constabulary, and say we have no confidence in them. How can we in conscience do that when the overwhelming majority of them are dutiful and decent and try their best to enforce the law? 
Now, there are people who have defunded the police in America. Uh, we've seen that dangerous folly. In Los Angeles, the city cut the police budget by $150 million in response to the demands of Black Lives Matter. The result, murders are up by 45%, assaults by 13%, all violent crime is up as the city has been hit by a devastating crime wave. In Seattle, they approved a cut in the police budget of 18%. Some protesters even envisaged, quote, a world without policing. The result, the police became absent from a whole area of six blocks, causing an unprecedented rise in violence against black people, because most of the victims in those six blocks were black people. The city has seen its highest number of murders in 26 years. Finally, in New York, Democrats cut more than one billion from the six billion police budget, the result of a predictable surge in violent crime through the shooting of a young child in Times Square. It's sometimes said that when America sneezes, the world catches the cold. But it's pure madness to follow the US down the route many cities uh, there have taken. Such policies are based on a profound misunderstanding of human nature. Successful public policy must always be informed by practical knowledge and understanding of the best and the worst of what humans can be, are capable of. On that point, I'd be happy to uh, give way. So talking in terms of public policy, why is it then that the small proportion of violent Black Lives Matter protesters outside Downing Street had enclosure measures put upon them last year? The ones that were spitting at the black policemen? Well, those ones. Whereas, where the Sir Everard vigil, we had enforcement because they were peaceful. That's not about individual policemen, that's about wide policy. And that policy has failed. And so that's not about when you have bad eggs. That, then, is about, actually, you're discriminating against people based on how peaceful you're willing to be. Or maybe you disagree with that. No, I don't disagree with that. I think that where the I mean, I've already acknowledged that police men and women make mistakes, and indeed police forces make mistakes. Leadership makes mistakes. And you're right. I mean, the, the Sarah Everard example was an appalling, an appalling case where she, much more should have been done much earlier. Of course, this man should have been identified. You're quite right. It is remarkable that he wasn't identified. And of course, once we knew that, even once we knew it, the idea that we could somehow nuance it was completely unacceptable. And there are other cases. This is a recent, and I will give away in just one second. I want to finish the sentence. That is a recent and powerful argument. I use it because you made it so compellingly. But of course, there are other cases. There are many cases peppered through history of police forces making mistakes, and sometimes catastrophic mistakes of that kind. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't have confidence in policing as a whole, because it's exceptional, disturbingly, horribly, Tragically exceptional. But every day there are policemen and women taking risks on the front line of crime for the people in this room to protect them from the horrors of what that crime might bring. I happily give way to a gentleman who's being protected by the police in that way. <laughs> in light of the figures given by the first speaker, such as one in ten policemen not being accounted for misconduct with handling, is it really that remarkable? Remarkable? Because it's hard to pretend to be surprised anymore. Well, I can only speak from my own experience in Nottinghamshire and Lincolnshire, where uh, I lived uh, when I was a student and now, and, and since uh, I was elected, I've lived as a member of parliament. And, and my experience with the police, and I, I obviously deal with them all the time through my constituents' experience. And of course, I do take up cases on behalf of constituents when things go wrong. You know, many, many, many times I've done that. But the overwhelming experience I have there is the policemen and women doing the right thing, and certainly trying to do the right thing. And if I were faced with this dilemma, do I stand by the police and remain confident in their core mission to defend us from crime? Or I stand against them and risk the chaos that disorder brings? I know. I know which side of that argument I'd be on. I'd be on the side of the argument that every person who's been a victim of crime would be on. That everyone who fears crime would be on. That everyone who knows the horror of crime, that every reformed criminal knows, because many criminals do reform and know. And that every hard-working, decent, honourable policeman and woman should be on. 
So I conclude by saying this in a sentence. I wholly acknowledge what you said in your opening remarks. I share that passion and that sorrow, actually, because it's much more about that. But I know that the overwhelming majority of police men and women would share that sorrow, that horror, that anger too. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sir John. Um, I think, can I just thank the first two speakers for taking uh, interventions? Just because it's the first debate of term, I think I should probably explain that I have to, I can't let a dialogue sort of erupt in the middle of the debate. I have to allow the speakers to make progress. So points of information have to be sort of short, pithy points, questions. This now is the opportunity for you to make a speech, if you'd like to. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask for floor speeches. I'd like them to be sort of between one and two minutes, relatively short. Uh, and we'll do it in proposition, opposition, and in abst uh, abstention, if you disagree with the phrasing of the motion. So does anyone want to make a brief floor speech in proposition of the motion this evening? I'm going to go to the back of the room over there. Yes. Yeah. Name and college, please. Thank you. So, Sybil, uh, Trinity Hall. Sorry, this is rather nerve-wracking, um, but I'm going to start it with an unpleasant story. Rather recently, uh, I had an interaction with the police. I never expected to, but, but I did. I was assaulted quite badly, the police were called. I, I promise to keep this short and sweet, perhaps not too sweet. It, it really can't be. The first responders arrived, but I wasn't put at ease. I wasn't filled with confidence. One informed me that he had never done this before and fumbled when taking the swabs and had to retake them again and again, the invasive swabs, whilst the other, more junior first responder, when the senior member was out, out of the room, asked me if it was awkward for, he, for me that he was a man. Awkward that they were both men. Similarly to Jamie, I've I've never before had an interaction with the police, and frankly, I had little confidence. What I wasn't expecting was that the police themselves would have little confidence in themselves, in the training that they had been given to respond to this sort of incident, in their ability to address the situation. I call it a situation, the crime. How should I, how should we, actually, how should we be expected to have confidence in a police force which has lost confidence in itself, which has no grounds to have confidence in itself? Thank you. Thank you very much. That was excellent. Uh, anyone in opposition of the motion this evening? Looking up in the rafters too. Anyone who would like to abstain? Just here. Kate. Hi, this is Kate. I'm from Wolfson College. And um, I want to start by perhaps highlighting, um, you know, both speakers were excellent, and also, despite the differences in opinion, both speakers pointed to the need for protecting the vulnerable. Now, I agree, I think, and, you know, I don't want to deny sort of the gravitas of victims um, of any type of crime, um, sexually motivated or not. I want to question the premise. Do the vulnerable need protection all the time? Well, the reason I'm asking this question is because I'm constantly reminded of the many instances when protection is used to inst instead like further harm on vulnerable populations, communities, individuals. I'm reminded of black and brown bodies that constantly get stopped for the protection of women 
um, I'm reminded of um, you know Muslim appearing individuals who gets you know randomly checked in airports because we need to protect from acts of terrorism. And I'm reminded of, um, in addition, after looking at this, of communities who you know are swept away from their native habitats because of you know building coal mines or factories for economic development or so-called economic development. So while it is, um, I think, true that victims need protection, I want to bring in another element, which is I think perpetrators might also need not necessarily protection, but perhaps rehabilitation, restoration, uh, teaching, awareness, and learning. And given that, um, given the context of the kind of relationship between victim and perpetrator, and you know, so often these two can get flipped around. So often a victim can become a perpetrator to someone else, and a perpetrator can actually be a victim or a victim of something that happened sometime else. I don't know. I'm confused, and I abstain. Thanks very much, Kate. Just before I move on to the next set of speakers, I am obligated to ask if there's any opposition speakers who'd like to go now, put your hand up, or forever hold your peace. Great. Uh, so we'll move straight across to the second uh, proposition speaker this evening, Hayden Prowse. Hayden is a British activist. We'll just hold that for one moment. Uh, Hayden, Hayden is a British activist, journalist, satirist, director, and comedian. He's best known for writing and performing uh, in BBC's BAFTA winning The Revolution Will Be Televised. Hayden, you have the ears of the house. Thank you very much. I find it interesting that uh, my conservative adversary was arguing against the defunding of the police when that's exactly what his party have been doing for the last 10 years. <laughs> to, the, to the tune of many billions of pounds, which is why I plan to argue that I have no faith in the police. I don't plan to convince you that the police are inherently racist, misogynist, corrupt, no more so than any other part of society. I guess the main difference being that they have handcuffs. I, plan to convince you of something perhaps more scary, which is that the police are completely and totally rubbish at doing their job. <laughs> and I'll tell you why. Um, my argument's going to be based around a sort of rigorous and wide-ranging data set, namely uh, the other evening when my girlfriend got her iPhone nicked. Um, she ran down the road, she spoke to a police officer on the street and informed him of what had happened. He said he was going to report the crime. He didn't, we'll come back to that later. She ran to find me, we got in the car, we were looking for the phone on, on Find My Phone on the Mac. We went to one flat, we spoke to a guy at the flat very politely, he didn't seem to know or hadn't seen anything. So we went to another block of flats, we could see the phone moving. We arrived at the next block of flats, we called the police, the police said they'd come to. Young constables came and found us, we were sitting there, we could see the, see the phone in the block of flats. The constables came up and the, and one of the young constables said, it's really weird, every time a phone goes missing, we always end up here outside this block of flats. And <laughs> I, just, I just don't understand why. And as this young Sherlock Holmes connected the clues in, <laughs> in his mind palace, um, my girlfriend and I suggested to him that maybe he'd go up and knock on a couple of doors, but this seemed to be, on his, be beyond his, his skill base, um, unfortunately. Um, and then we discovered subsequently that the guy that she spoke to in the first instance hadn't even reported the crime. So this is a fundamental failure of the police force. And everybody has stories like this. I got £16,000 worth of equipment stolen on a, on a film shoot a couple of years ago. And I called up the police to tell them what had happened. And they said, sorry, that's not enough money for it to even register on our radar. So we're not going to investigate it. Imagine if that sort of thing happened in different areas of public service. Uh, you know, your rubbish is piling up outside your door, and they're like, sorry, sir, unless there's free-flowing sewage, we can't come down and check that out. It just doesn't come up on our radar. Even our president of the, of the union here told me just over dinner that he'd been assaulted in the street and mugged, and there was very little they could do. They couldn't even swab. There seems to be a big problem with swabbing in the police force, which is something else that should be addressed. Um, so this seems to be a wide-ranging problem, and I'm a white, middle-class heterosexual male. The police force was literally designed to protect me. <laughs> and people like me, it's almost a sort of subconscious need within the police. It's like a mother bear. They, they sort of see me and they're like, quick, protect his privilege, protect his assets. And even I have this experience, have had this experience with the police. So I dread to think what it's like for people from more marginalised communities. I, I live in Hackney and every day I walk down Kingsland Road 
And um, I don't want to stereotype the police, um, unlike the police, which seem to be very happy to do that to other, <laughs> to other people. But all they ever seem to be doing is stopping and pulling black guys out, out of cars. Their approach to defeating crime seems to be a sort of form of racially aggravated lucky dip scratch card. It's like... <laughs> it's like <laughs> There's a black guy in a car, quick, he might have some weed or a knife on him. Fuck it, give it a go. <laughs> it's hardly CSI. Um, yes. And if I, was for, if I was a black or brown person from one of those communities and I was playing my taxes, I, got, I mean, the, the traffic in London is so bad right now anyway, I'd be pretty pissed off that I was essentially paying someone to make me late for work every single day of my life. Um, Apparently, this is a fact I'm going to drop. The majority of murders are committed by white men like me, but there are six stops for every thousand person for white people, stop and search, compared to 54 stops for every 1,000 black person. I think that's in the capital, which is pretty insane, I think. Um, and again, I don't think that's a fundamentally deep racism that's running, coursing through the police force. I just think they're really badly trained and shit at their job and they don't have the resources, partly because of the party of my uh, noble adversary over there. Um, moving on. Yes, thank God, because I wasn't sure where I was. Yeah, yeah. I am pro D. I'm not pro D. No, I'm pro fund the police. I'm going to come to that. I'm saying fund the police more so they can be better at serving their community. But thank you for raising that point. Um, yes. Ah, my debating partner alerted me to a uh, quite shocking incident the other day where a young woman had been assaulted on the street so badly that she'd been sent to hospital and had to have surgery and she was given about nine months recovery time. There was CCTV of the incident, uh, the police didn't get back to her, they didn't check up on any statements, they didn't even release a picture of the, of the assailant. And only when she tweeted this, and my colleague uh, Jamie retweeted it, that it became viral, did the police get back to her. Essentially, you have to go viral these days in order to get any justice, which seems to be a fundamental failure of the police force. <laughs> the police force are actually more obsessed with social media than the young women that they're failing to protect on the teenage girls that they're failing to protect on our streets right now. There are... <laughs> There are, oh, they're current, this is on the flip side of it, even though they're failing to actually police crimes, at the same time they're policing non-crimes. This is literally a word, non-crimes. I think there were 3,000 non-crimes investigated last year, <laughs> mostly because of mean tweets. And, I'm, you know, people being offensive online, essentially. I'm, I'm looking forward to the next series of Luther, where the hardball detective gets allocated to the mean tweet department. <laughs> And the PTSD and trauma he accrues from it, he just can't deal with it because of some of the mean things that were said online. Look, I'm not, I'm not sort of undermining how cruel pe people can be online, but I just would like to humbly suggest that we reallocate some of the resources going to non-crime towards actual fucking crime. Um, how long have I got left? Just a few minutes. Uh, in Scotland, there's a crime bill right now that allows uh, you to uh, essentially go to prison for uh, stirring up hatred or being abusive, and it allows you to be prosecuted even for things you might say in your home, essentially turning your kids into sort of mini Stasi. Imagine the temptation to send your dad down for hate crime when he won't allow you to go to a party on a Saturday night. <laughs> this is going to bend badly for all... I mean, you guys are too young to really be fearful of this yet, but for some of us, this is a serious problem. Convictions, while all this is happening, convictions are way down. Uh, the rate of murder, which the, the rate of convictions for murder, which once stood at nine out of 10 solved, is now down to one in three unsolved, which is pretty shocking, I think. The rate of um, rape convictions in the last two years is down, uh, is, is, is go has gone from 13% to 17%, which I think is pretty bad. Uh, and in the meantime, the government don't seem to be policing the rich and powerful at all. There seems to be a complete double standards. I don't know if you saw this party recently that may or may not have happened in the garden of number 10, but I don't know if you ever walked past number 10. There are literally 10 police officers on the door at any one time. The police officers were the bouncers for the illegal party. The police officers were the bouncers for the illegal party. Um, there's also obviously uh, Prince Andrew, our, our noble um, pedo, alleged prince. <laughs> allegedly, I said allegedly, so it's fine, I can say that. Um, and um, there's a big question now, right, isn't there, whether or not he was at Pizza Express in Woking. All the police have to do is check their records. He has a detail assigned to him at all times. 
<laughs> so this is the double standards we're dealing with. I have one more point. Um, ah, underfunding. I'm coming back to the underfunding. The irony of arguing against some conservatives here is it's, it's them that's been under, underfunding the police for the, the past 10 years. Um, and it's strange uh, that they have faith in a police force that they dismantled. If they have faith in the police and they can't, um, if they have faith in the police, they cannot believe in the rule of law because yeah, they can't believe in the rule of law. They're almost like the, the, the sort of anarchic anarchy party because they're the ones that have contributed to the state of anarchy that we're currently living in, even though they sort of brand themselves as the party of law and order, which I think is quite hypocritical. Um, you know, the police have been over-politicised, they've been reduced to sort of security LARPing, they don't really do much apart from stand around the statue, whenever there's a protest they sort of jostle and pretend to defend it from a couple of Instagram anarchists. That's literally the limit of their abilities right now. They're not fit for purpose because they couldn't find my girlfriend's phone. <laughs> Thank you, Hayden. I'm pretty sure there's a convention somewhere about not being allowed to invoke the presence to substantiate your point, but I let it slide because I couldn't remember what it was. Um, but thank you for that amusing speech. Uh, to the opposition and Sam Bidwell. Uh, Sam is a third-year law student at Sydney Sussex College, uh, and he won this spot through open audition. I do hope lots of you get involved with these throughout the rest of the term. Sam, the floor is yours. Now, that is going to be a difficult act to follow. I promise that I won't even be as half as funny, but I hope that I can be at least half as insightful. Um, there is an old European saying which goes something like this. In heaven, the cooks are Italian, the Germans are the mechanics, the lovers are all French, and the police are all British. Meanwhile, in hell, the Germans are the lovers, the French are the mechanics, the British cook the food, and the Italians do the policing. <laughs> Now, I will try and spend as little time as possible talking about either French lovers or British food, though I'm sure we would all have plenty to say on both topics. But there is a reason, there is a serious reason, that if you speak to people outside of this country, the police force in this country, the British police force, remains a point of acclaim and praise and something that I think we should be deeply, deeply proud of. Because when we get a little bit of perspective about where we sit in the world, when we think about all the alternatives, when we look at the core principles of our police force, I think it's worth reforming, it's worth having enough confidence in to reform. If a tree is suffering rot, you chop off the branches, you don't uproot it. Uh, not yet. <laughs> if we want to talk about roots, I'm afraid we're going to have to go back to 1829, which for all but the classicists in the room is a while ago. <laughs> Now, I'll keep the history lecture as short as possible. Was there a PO either? No, I'm hearing things. Always a good start. Um, in 1829, in his infinite wisdom, Sir Robert Peel decides to set up the first nationally administered police force in this country, the Metropolitan Police, which, while its modern formulation may be deeply, deeply flawed, was founded with some of the, mo the, the most wise principles that one could possibly found such an institution on. There was fear in this country in 1829 that the police would reflect that model which we have seen elsewhere across the world throughout history, a means by which kings or presidents or councils of sages can impose rules, can, it can enter communities with lethal force and administer rules to which those, commu not yet, to which those communities have had no say to march in and impose and to act as an authoritarian force. And that the way in which our country's police force was set up is specifically designed to counter this. And this, these aren't just nice principles, these ideas of integrity and transparency and policing by consent, they're not just principles. They are genuinely reflected in some important areas of policy, which we are very, very lucky to have and which it is easy to miss. There are 18 countries on the world's surface which have an unarmed police force. Britain is one of them. It's the only country with more than 20 million people to maintain a majority unarmed police force. Of the other 17, 15 were set up by the British. So for those of you who are better at maths than I am, that means there are two countries in the world which independently came to the idea that we should not authorize our pedestrian police officers to use lethal force 
against members of the public. This is exceptional. This is truly exceptional. And of course, I have deep respect and confidence in an institution which has held back the tide of increasing militarization in the United States and in Europe, and has said, no, we will not be arming our pedestrian police officers with either guns or tasers. Uh, I will take you now, yes. Um, what's the inspiration for Robert Peel's establishment um, based on what he did in Ireland as chief secretary, which was an armed paramilitary force used to put down every single rebellion? And I think it's really interesting he could go in to take the legacy of what the British did in India, what the British did in Pakistan, what the British did in Kenya, with those so wonderful and lovely police force that pulled out people's nails and drove them to killing. I think that's quite a radical. With respect, none of those countries are on the list of 18. <laughs> Look, I, t I take the point, and, and of course, you know, in, in some ways, yes, it was an inspiration. Of course it was. And, and what Peel did in Ireland is deeply flawed. There's a reason that he's known as Orange Peel. Um, but it is also worth noting that much of the, uh, much of the policing that arose out of the 1829 Act, was construed in direct opposition to this. Ireland was not viewed as a policy success at that time, it was viewed as a policy failure. And actually, if, if we look into the rationale for the Act, if we check Hansard in 1829, which no one else here is boring enough to do, <laughs> you will find that the Irish case is specifically cited as, as a case to avoid in future, to focus more on policing in the community and more, by, more on policing by consent. And it's a shame, it's a deep, deep, deep shame that that was never implemented in practice by the British in Ireland. And I have respect for that point, but I will move on. So, yes, we have this unarmed police force, which we are deeply, deeply fortunate to have retained. And so, of course, I have confidence in a force which has resisted calls for this. I also have confidence in a force which has repeatedly resisted calls for police officers as a class of people to be given a particular special legal status, as is commonplace in most countries. I have deep respect for an institution and a police force which has put itself, as flawed as they may be, through more layers of tribunal and committee and commission than any other country in the world. To obtain an arrest warrant in this country is not the same as it is in most of the rest of the world. It's far, far, far more difficult. And that's not to say that we, everybody follows the rules all the time, because of course they don't. Why else would we have a police force? But the point is that the police as an institution at its very core, the roots of that tree, still adhere to those Peelian ideas, the idea that we should police by consent, that police should be unarmed, that they should use their brains rather than their Bren guns to watch over our communities and to administer law and order in a way which suits those communities. Now, I'm not going to say here and now that the police in the modern day are perfect. Of course they aren't. Of course they're not. And the reform that I would want to see is perhaps much the same as the rest of you in this room. It also almost certainly differs. We all have different ideas about what we'd like to do with the police. But I have enough confidence that an institution founded in 1829 and which has survived as a celebrated, acclaimed institution in the rest of the world, which is the envy of police forces worldwide. I have enough faith in the idea that that institution, just as it rose to 1929, will also be able to rise to 2029. I have enough faith that the institution can go far. I have enough faith in those roots. Uh, I'm coming to the end, but I'll take you now. Well, as, as I say, if we're thinking about how the police view themselves, it's of course important to look at the principles on which it was founded and which have then influenced changes in that policy. So, of course, if, if we're going to think about, as I say, I have, I have faith in, uh, of course, I probably don't have faith in the police of 1829. I'm not dealing with that many uh, pickpockets as they were in 1829, nor as many um, street side embezzlers selling poor silver. We're dealing with very, very different crimes nowadays. So in the modern context, of course, I would have faith in that institution. But I have faith in the idea that its core ideas, its core principles, its founding, founding doctrine 
is worth having confidence in, is worth preserving, and that the best way to secure reform that is going to make everybody a lot happier with how justice is administered in this country is to trust in those principles, not to write them off, and to, to work from that position of confidence to build a better justice system for everybody. Thank you. That was outstanding you did. Thank you. Very, very good. Fantastic work to handle the intervention. Well done. Well done. Thank you. Well done. Thank you, Sam, for that marvellous speech. Uh, we have one more round of floor speeches to go. So, does anyone have a speech in proposition? The first hand was up there. Have we got a mic? We can get to him. Thank you. Um, I just want to start off by talking a little bit about the word confidence. And the uh, second gentleman for the opposition referred to confidence and trees rotting. Now, if a tree was rotting, yes, I'd cut down the branches, but say I had confidence on it would mean that I could then build a tree house on it. And I think that what the gentleman would find is that if you tried to build a tree house on a tree with rot, no matter how many branches he cut down, he couldn't be confident that it would still stay there. And now moving back to the first speaker. Now, whilst the world may be imperfect, uh, the standards which we hold it to cannot be so comfortable with that imperfection as allows the police to no longer serve in their role to protect society and to protect it in such a way which aims to have complete law and order. In a system which respects the rule of law, the police aren't designed to have our confidence in them. They are designed to be watched. They are designed to be monitored, to have oversight and to adhere to the suggestions that are made by the committees that oversee it. I do think that life is a little bit like shooting a gun. You land just below where you aim and currently the police are shooting the ground. Um, would anyone like to make a speech in opposition this evening? There must be one person in this chamber. <laughs> Just here. Excellent. Name and college, please. Yep. So, Owen Cooper, Selwyn College. So, ultimately, going back to the idea of Peelian principles, I believe it was Robert Peel who said that, uh, as has been previously quoted, the people, are, uh, sorry, the, the police are the public and the public are the police. And ultimately, I think that those Pelian principles still stand true today. Ultimately, the police... <laughs> why is accountability uh, for the police uh, uh, so inconsistent compared to the general population? Absolutely. So ultimately, with accountability of the police, the police should be held accountable by the general populace. And we can all use our freedom of speech to say what we think about them. However, what I'd like to note about the public of the police and the police of the public is that ultimately um, all UK citizens have a right to, citizens or, uh, to make a citizen's arrest in a specific circumstance. Therefore, one might argue that uh, ultimately every, every UK citizen is working together as part of the police. But also, one of the things I'd like to note uh, is that... Uh, Quite frankly, perhaps not, but ultimately we all have the power to, which uh, is ultimately nice in sentiment. Uh, yeah, so, although one of the other things I'd like to note is that with the whole idea of policing by consent, one might regard it as a self-fulfilling prophecy for the system to collapse when individuals lose confidence in the police force. And ultimately, my interactions with the police, so I once had my phone stolen, and ultimately the police force managed to resolve it, in a way that was most satisfying to myself. Sorry, I got scared to sit down. Thank you. A absolutely. So, ultimately, with the police force, there are major issues. However, I see, personally, um, the issue of having no confidence in the police as being, as a sort of seeing that the police should somehow either be radically overthrown or replaced with some kind of social solution or private security which only protects the rich. And ultimately, I have confidence in the police, and I believe there are issues, but those issues need to be... 
Um, I'll, I'll, I'll decline. So um, I'm ultimately um, so, uh, summing up anyway. But um, yeah, so basically, um, what I would like to say is that um, I see the issue um, in question being ultimately that I do have confidence in the police, and I believe the solutions to all of the problems that the police force has are evolution by individuals raising problems and those concerns being answered by an accountable government. And ultimately, the solution is not revolution, which would lead to an anarchistic potential security disaster in which we are not protected from, say, for instance, violent crime or terrorism or other things by a strong police force with intelligence that can protect us from such things. Uh, <laughs> Um, Festus was right to be slightly annoyed, so I'm going to wear this with a light touch. You do, I'm not going to intervene if I don't have to. If you are speaking and someone says, stands up whilst you're speaking, you don't have to take it. Owen, I mean, that was very generous of you to take so many. Uh, uh, any speeches in abstention? I, I have no idea who put their hand up first. I'm going to, I'm going to go there. I think it was that gentleman there. Sorry. Uh, hello. Um, I'm just going to say in advance, I may have had slightly too much of the court side from the orator, seven pounds, a little bit too expensive. Um, I'm just... <laughs> now, what I want to say firstly is I really enjoyed, uh, I've enjoyed all the speeches, and, but the first speech particularly moved me. And there, there I was sitting down and I was listening to the second speech um, and something didn't really seem to click. Something, there was something slightly off and I couldn't really tell what it was. Now, th this gentleman over here was talking... Um, a lot about what the police should be and what the police should do. You can probably tell where I'm, where I'm going here. Um, but there was one, one particular thing that he said that really made me stop and think, and then I, and then I, I got it, I realised. I had a eureka moment. My eureka moment was when he said, the police are bad, we should punish them. We should punish the police. And that made me think the exact problem that's at the heart of this issue is the very fact that the people who are meant to punish are the ones sending photos of dead bodies that they're supposed to be hunting down. Um, and I think, uh, who, who is it? Uh, was it? Alex there, yeah. He said, it, I think, the, the point quite a bit earlier in the emergency debate, which was that when we have a problem and we think that the way to go around solving that problem is through consolidation and centralization of force and punishment, that's not really going to solve the problem. And I, I can't see... Um, I can't see it making sense that we give the police, the, the police who have these, these uh, problems of, that we've already talked about, people more eloquent than me have said, problems with their attitude, problems with how they deal with, with crimes, etc., uh, that our response is to think about punishment and go down this, this line of we need to put these people and bend them into sh to shape with a big old hammer. Now... There are, there are some other things I want to say, because I'm, I'm, I'm an abstention, I'm, I'm an abstention. I did want to say uh, opposition, but I'm an abstention. Um, and that's because I think the second speaker here made a very important point. So confidence is, uh, it's a subjective opinion about a set of circumstances. So um, am I confident? Do I, do I think more about the weaknesses or the strong points? Now I think it is important to remember that our police force, while flawed, is a lot better in a lot of ways than most other police forces in the world. And I'm not personally confident in our police force, but I'm very glad that I live in this country with this police force rather than any other country, and certainly not America with guns. So that I'm, I'm done there, that's all I have to say. Uh, Right, we're doing okay for time. I'll take one extremely short. I think it was Emily in the blue shirt at the back. It has to be less than a minute, please. Is it in abstention? Good. Less than a minute, please. So I'm an American. I don't really have any stakes in this. It seems to me that there is agreement on what is meant by Her Majesty's police force. The proposition seems to be assuming that however the current policemen are acting defines the institution. The opposition seems to be assuming that the institution is defined by its job, its principles, what it's founded upon, and what it's striving to do, perhaps imperfectly. So if we can't agree on what 
on which of these is true, then I don't think that we can decide whether we agree with the, the motion or not. Thank you. Less than a minute. You sure? Right, one more. Uh, Mike back there. One more. Less than a minute, please. Um, a few points have been raised about um, police and by consent and the fact that this, these are the principles that the Met and police officers hold. But the reality is for too many communities of colour, that reality doesn't stand for them. Police and by consent doesn't, uh, is, doesn't hold true for them. And we see that with the incent, in, incessant handcuffing that is applied to so many um, communities of colour in London, and we see that with the fact that black people in this country are eight times more likely to be stopped and searched, despite the fact that stop and searches um, are only, um, only 4% of them have positive outcomes. And so it's quite clear that this police and by consent model remains an ideal for too many in this country. And how can communities of colour have trust and faith in, in a police force that doesn't have trust and confidence in them? Thank you very much. I'm going to move to the last two paper speakers now um, and to John T. Yin, who is going to wrap up for the proposition case. John T. is a second year law student at Downing College. Uh, like Sam here, he won his spot through Open Audition. John T., the floor is yours. Well, thank you. There's quite a lot to follow on from, from there, so I will do my best to match the important, importance of the issues at play today. Now, last time I spoke in this chamber, I opened with a maxim, because I find that they very often, very pithily, convey and encapsulate an important principle. And so tonight, I'm going to do the same. The Roman satirist Juvenal is credited with the phrase, Qui custodet ipsos custodes? Who guards the guards themselves? An important question. Our classical ancestors pondered this at great length. Plato questioned whether political abuse of power was inherent and likely. But if we apply that question to our police today, who guards the guards themselves? Unfortunately, the only answer I can come to, overall at least, is no one who's doing a particularly good job. In society, the rights of the whole cannot be deemed protected unless the rights of those most vulnerable are ensured. I'm sure we can all agree on that. And it is here that I believe Her Majesty's police force have truly failed. Tonight, I make three points in furtherance of Juvenal's maxim, highlighting beyond doubt, in my view at least, that effective oversight of our police has become nothing more than a comfortable lie that a system is all too often a hotbed of racism, authoritarianism, sexism, and corruption. Now, my colleague has already addressed sexism, and I don't think I'm very well placed to discuss that today, so I won't. But I will address those other three. Now, I am not here to argue that the centuries of reform that have been brought about by the hard work and sacrifice of those most downtrodden in our society have been for nothing nor to say that every officer is malicious. Of course there are good people. No, I'm not talking about a few bad apples. I am talking about a rot stemming from the tree itself. So first, a lack of sufficient oversight is leading to the targeting of vulnerable minority groups with excessive policing. We've heard about that already tonight. The police continue to show that they are willing to discriminate the statistics for stop and search powers are quite frankly concerning. The Office for National Statistics shows that nine times as many black people were stopped as white people. And still the use of the controversial power rises. 24% it rose last year, and that was with lockdowns. During lockdown, a disproportionate number of fines too for breaking lockdown went to the BAME community. Perhaps some of the people in this chamber know exactly what I mean. How can we have confidence in a police force that treats enforcement of the law as a pick-and-mix exercise? It's quite frankly ludicrous. 
The Metropolitan Police, even so, refuses to investigate an investigation into Downing Street parties due to them ha happening too long ago. And yet, they're perfectly happy to investigate a party allegedly attended by Sean Bailey, despite the fact that that party happened before the alleged parties that happened in Downing Street. Now, to me, I can't see how those parties are different. But perhaps these differences stem from a system built on bigotry and bias. And yet, Dame Cressida Dick fails to recognise that there's an issue at hand. When those overseeing the police force cannot accept there is an issue, much less seek to tackle it, there is no true police accountability. And without accountability, I cannot have confidence. Jefferson once said that he who sacrifices freedom for security deserves neither. And insufficient checks on police power have all too often led to excessive curbs on our rights, our fundamental rights, those outlined in our European Convention of Human Rights, in our Human Rights Act. And this is ever more pertinent today with the crime and security, police crime, security and courts bill hurtling its way through Parliament like a grenade with the pin removed. Now, I'm quite happy the House of Lords rejected it in its current form. I'm very glad, although I do fear that the 1945 Parliament Act is going to let it be forced through a year from now in any case. If the legislature itself, though, cannot have confidence in our police, confidence for them to have any more power, what hope do we have? They're the ones giving them the power in the first place. No, the police have shown at least in some circumstances, that given an inch, they can take a mile. And this is not something we can have confidence in. During this pandemic, we saw the prime examples of the police abusing their power, many and many a time. Now, we've already heard what happened with sexism, with policing of protests, and with rape. But I'm going to talk about the Coronavirus Act, specifically. In Derbyshire, the police denounced those who were exercising in the fells, using drones to publish footage of them for name and shame. Now, the important point to note there is that those exercising in the fells were not breaking the law. The police were, in fact, using powers they were never given, despite how wide the Coronavirus Act may well have been. And yet, even so, the police commissioner for Derbyshire said that it wasn't fair to criticise them because the power was necessary. Now, I'm not here to tell you how much power the police should have. There are people here who are far more qualified to talk about that than I am. But what I am here to say is that we should not allow the police to use powers they should not have, that they were not given. As Lord Sumption rightly said, the police act, when the police act as if they believe that in a crisis they can do as they see fit, that is dangerously close to a police state. I do not want us to go closer to that boundary. Are the guards guarded when there is no consequence for them breaking the rules? No. If we are to have confidence in people who are charged with ensuring accountability, in a force who are able to undermine the very principles and equal and predictable use of the rule of law, the rule of law that says everyone is equal under the law, if we support that, then quite frankly, that is how democracy dies. So finally, those who are tasked with ensuring that the police serve their purpose are using this position to prevent their own rule baking from coming to light. Lord Acton's wise recognition that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely seems all too obvious these days to apply to those who guard our guards. At this point, quite frankly, it's hard to remember how many parties, sorry, my apologies, how many work meetings with wine and cheese the government is alleged to have had all the way from a simple civil servant all the way up to the prime minister of this country. On a side note, if anyone does know how to entirely forget whether they were or weren't at something, please speak to me at the end. I really want to forget my exams. They were absolutely horrible. <laughs> but in any case, whilst the police punished those who were grieving and fined those in mourning, time and again, they steer clear of investigating their political masters. 
And this cannot be right. No one guards the guards when those with this critical task use it to abuse their own power. The Good Law Project recently launched their claim against the Met over their handling of the Downing Street parties. And yet, the police chose not to permit them to publish their pre-action response. And this is the first time it has happened to the Good Law Project. I cannot, quite frankly, in good conscience, say that this is transparency and accountability. Cicero once said that when weapons thunder, the laws are silent. Perhaps he would have been more correct were he to say when the government obfuscates, the thin blue line is always on hand to conceal what they were doing. So to conclude, a great man once lived by the motto, with great power comes great responsibility. <laughs> now, I'm not entirely sure if Dame Cressida ever had the privilege of meeting Uncle Ben or Aunt May Parker. And considering they're fictitious, I'm going to go out on a limb and say probably not. But perhaps she would do well to go and watch the film and take heed of their warning. Because as long as Her Majesty's police force fail to demonstrate a modicum of responsibility in their upper echelons, I have no confidence in their power. Because I have no confidence in racism, I have no confidence in authoritarianism, and I have no confidence in corruption. And until Juvenal's timeless question can be answered, who guards the guards themselves? Why, someone honest, someone just, someone fair. Neither should this house. Thank you. Thank you. Great, great job. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you, John T. And I'm now going to move to Festus Akimbosoi to finish this debate for us this evening. Uh, Festus is uh, a Conservative politician who has been the Bedfordshire Police and Crime Commissioner since 2021. He is also the first Black Briton elected to this role. Festus, you have our attention. Well, <clears throat> good evening. That was a bit rubbish. Good evening. Good. All right. Good evening, friends. Uh, I would like to describe you all as friends, because I think that's what we all are. We might disagree once in a while, but uh, hopefully you will not disagree with me. <laughs> you see, the thing is this, right? Everyone is a comedian and can have, give laughs, Damien, until you stand in front of someone who has just been bashed in the back of the head with a glass bottle and you stand in front of them, trying to stitch their head back, their heads together, putting, uh, doing first aid until the ambulance arrives. That was me as a special constable, as a unpaid police officer. Everyone can get cheap laughs, Damien, until you have to talk with the mother of a boy that has been beaten to death by a group of two boys two other men, over a girl. And this mother tells you that the police have been a huge asset to their family during this absolutely horrendous moment. This boy that was killed was a boy that I mentored growing up in London. Everyone can get cheap laughs until you go to a home of somebody who has been a victim of serious sexual violence and domestic abuse. And a cop was sat in front of this woman for three hours, consoling her, while the other cop was on the phone, talking to their partner, saying, we're coming to you, we're coming to find you. Hand yourself in now, or else I'm gonna send my mates after you to find you, so better you just hand yourself in. I was one of those cops as an unpaid special constable. See, that's not so funny now, is it? That is the reality of 21st century policing. My friends, I'm very sorry about your mobile phone. I'm very sorry about that. But if I was a chief constable, which I am not, and I have a choice in front of me, do you go to that, rob do you go, do you go to that murder, potential murder? Do you go to that rape? Not yet. 
or do you prioritize the loss of the mobile phone? What would you do? Not yet. I must finish before I'll let you come through. So yes, we can have a good laugh about this. And I promise you, I can be quite funny sometimes. But this is far too important to be a laughing matter. And I'm standing in front of you here as somebody, probably the only person in this room, I'm happy to be corrected, probably the only person in this room who has been on the receiving end of those disproportionalities you talk about. I have been stopped and searched not once, not twice, not three times, not even four, not five, not yet. Six times I have been stopped and searched. And not once has anything been found on me. But guess what? I have also stopped and searched people, black and white. Uh, who, do you want to come in? No? Okay. Yes, sir. Um, if it's not a laughing matter, why are certain members of the police force allowed to laugh about the bodies of dead women in WhatsApp? It is absolutely unacceptable. <laughs> Great point. It is absolutely unacceptable. And you know what? I am so damn proud that they were sacked. And I'm so damn proud that they went to prison. And you know what? The reality is this. I'll tell you some facts now. Between 2010 and 2021, I think, anybody want to know how many cases of medical negligence the NHS accrued? There were 8,000 or thereabouts in 2010, and it's now over 12,000. Do you still trust the NHS? Anybody want to know how many police officers roughly get dismissed for gross misconduct um, every week? About one a week. If you were sick, would you go to the doctors? I believe you probably would do. Does that mean that you have no confidence in the NHS or in the medical profession? If you are a black woman, you're more than likely than any other white woman to lose your child in childbirth in this country. Do you have confidence in the NHS? If you are a young black boy, you're multiple times more likely to be excluded from school than a white boy. Do you have confidence in the education system? Okay, you don't. But you're all in a fancy university though, right? <laughs> but here, so this is, not, this is not an issue, this is not an issue just about the police. Society has got problems. And policing, as my friend mentioned earlier on, is one in Britain where we police by consent and the police are drawn from the public. And the worst of us, sometimes, and I have seen it, because as a police and crime commissioner now, and just to answer your rhetorical arguments, when next you see Juvenal, okay, tell him I said, in response to who polices the police, that kind of stuff, tell him that the British police is probably the most scrutinized police force in the whole world. You have the IOPC, the Independent Office for Police Conduct, which most police officers actually hate. Um, if we, we have the HMI CFRS, the Her Majesty's Inspector. Once I will come to you in a second. The HMI CFRS, Her Majesty's Inspectorate of Constabulary, Fire Rescue and, uh, Fire and Rescue Service, not very well liked. Then you have police and crime commissioners like myself, who can sit down the chief constable and say, "Look, tell me why is it that we have this level of disproportionality in this police force?" And I dare say to you, madam, my police force has got the lowest disproportionality ratio in this country for stop and search and use of force. Just plugging that in. You can clap, by the way, it's cool. <laughs> can you have my water? Yes, can you have my water? Yeah. I sat through the inquiry about the vigil for Sarah Everett. And what's their finding? I testified for four hours, and their finding was that the police acted entirely appropriately. It is a process. They are independent of the police, and just because, one times second, times madam, us. one second, madam, just because you did not have your way doesn't mean that they were wrong. It is a democracy, okay? I'm just saying to you now, I certain, I saw, certain I wins on... But they also saw the videos as well, didn't they? And, that's, and look what they did. Well, they made a decision. Yeah, the wrong one. This is, that's fair enough. I mean, you can disagree with that, and that's fine, and there are some decisions that the HMIC uh, come up with that I disagree with as well. I get that. But what I'm going to say is this. When you are voting this evening, you're not just voting whether you hate the police or you have confidence in the police or not. 
what you're doing is potentially sending a message to people out there about the people who will, I hope to God none of you get into an RTC on your way home today, a road traffic collision, because guess who's gonna be there before the ambulance? A police officer. I hope none of you get into a situation where you get stabbed. Because who's going to be there first? A police officer. And I'm sorry, madam, about your experience. I do hear a lot about that. One of the reasons why you have some of those issues is because we've got so many police officers being recruited now. Many of them are still not experienced enough. But you know what? I, I, I rate them so much because they have a lot of courage and guts to actually get out there and try to do something. So yes, the cuts took place between 2010 and 2015. History did not start in 2010. There was another government. There was a financial crisis. I'm not, going to, I'm not going to say anything about who was driving the car. But guess what's been happening since 2015? More cash investment is now going into policing than ever before. And in my police force, we've got more police officers than we've ever had before. Information. Yes, madam. Yeah, I mean, that's a really... I, but the thing about this, madam, is that with, tra with experience comes confidence. That is a fact of life. And so we do not have... You do not come out of police probation after two years and you become a fully-fledged, experienced police officer. But to finish my point, this is not just about whether we have confidence in the police or not. This is about what is the alternative. Defund the police... Well, here's the thing. If you go to America, try Portland, where they defunded the police, crime went up 530% for homicides. Go to Oakland, California, where they defunded the police, homicides went up by 300%. Chicago, uh, 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 New York, Maryland, in all of those er areas where they defunded the police, homicides went up by over 50%. No. <laughs> So to finish off, I am not here to argue that policing is excellent. My job as a policing crime commission is to try and make it better. And I am one of the people who should be on that side, okay, for what I have been through, saying to you that I have no confidence in the police. But I tell you now, having been on this side of the fence as well, having seen lives being saved, literally, as in being in uniform, I bloody have confidence in these men and women who will put their lives on the line to save you, 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 and indeed me. I hope you will side, no anymore, I hope you will side with the majority of the British public, which the Ipsos Mori poll for, for last year showed 65% of the British public trust the police. Back the British people, back that opinion, don't work against it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Festus, for that powerful speech. Um, before we wrap up, can I thank everyone who got involved this evening and did so in such good faith? Um, really enjoyed this evening. And can I thank the speakers, too, for taking so many interventions? <laughs> Um, if you haven't been here before, the way this works is we um, vote by our feet. As you go through the exits this evening, you'll have a door that says uh, no's, a door that says eyes. If you go through the middle, you can abstain. I haven't got any notices, I don't think, apart from to say that the debate next week is another controversial one. It's on whether Northern Ireland should remain part of the United Kingdom. Thank you very much. See you next week. <laughs>